Right. No, it's just me and you, Stu. Just, just the two of you, us. Buddy. Right. You good to go? Yes, please. Let's go. Right. Wonderful. Hello and welcome to Off The Beat and Track podcast. And joining me today via the means of Zoom is Will Gould of Creeper. Hello. Hello, Stu. How are you? I'm good, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, it's, again, it's another day waking up without having a haircut, which is a bit problematic for me, you know. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm desperate to get out to a barber. Have you managed to do that yet? Have you managed I, to have, get out to a... I have. Um, I have. I, yeah, I've managed to get um, a hairdresser to come round um, and sat in the garden and done my wife's hair. And, uh, and I was like, do you do like guy's hair as well? <laughs> and he was like, uh, yes, of course I do. I, mean, I, was like, oh, I just wanted to ask. And so, yeah, I managed to get a haircut. But up until then, um, my daughter had been sort of hacking away and, and done, a, done an half decent job, you know, of what's left on, on the top of my head. But, um, but yeah, I did drive past queues um, to the barbers the other day and they were huge. It looks mad. I think that's one of the things. I know it's such a, such a ridiculous, like the vanity thing, uh, a vain thing to say. But that's one of the main things I've missed. Just I just feel so unpleasant every time my hair grows out over my ears and stuff. And so my girlfriend's been doing the same thing, just hacking the sides off. With uh, we bought like a, a pair of clippers off eBay. She's been doing the sides, but she won't touch the top. But when my hair is so thick, it just kind of mushrooms out at the top, and it's awful every single day, you know. And it's the, the good thing is that's the one good thing about uh, being in lockdown and promoting an album is uh, I haven't had to have my picture taken too much because we, we can't get together with a photographer. So uh, I feel like it would be a nightmare if I, could, if I was photographed right now. My hair is just disgusting. <laughs> um, I, I mean, before we get on to uh, the, the songs that you've picked, Will, um, how, how have you found, you know, ha hair aside, how have you <laughs> found um, like lockdown as, 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 as both a, a human being and as a creative? I, I, the thing is about it, uh, to be honest with you, is like, I've, I'm, I'm, we're from punk rock, and so like the idea of kind of making something with limited resources is pretty, it's pretty, it's the, the way we started in the first place, you know, in Ian Shed writing, um, writing songs at his mum's house, you know, we're used to, 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 to making something out of nothing. So the idea of making content at this time, it's kind of been more of a fun challenge than anything else as, as a creative. I haven't found that too, too bad, like I've, uh, I've kind of enjoyed the challenge of it all a little. On a personal level, it's, it's, you know, like I have days when everything's absolutely fine. I have those days, and I'm sure you do as well, where you wake up and you're just like, what, what am I doing? Like, this is so frustrating. I just want to be outside. Why aren't we on tour? Why aren't we doing this? But I try to keep in mind um, the fact that this really, I, 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 as far as who this affects the most, I'm pretty far down the list. <laughs> so, sure. um, yeah, I, I, try, I try to keep the focus of that and that kind of grounds me a little bit. And I've been very lucky to be, to be locked in with my girlfriend a lot of this time. And I know people with partners, they were just, they haven't, didn't see for three months, you know? So, yeah. unfortunate. Okay, well, let's kick things off. Track one, Will, the song with the greatest ever intro. So I've gone for Modern Love, um, David Bowie. Um, and I think it's, I, like, I was thinking about this um, and I feel like I've got a good choice with this one. I feel like I've done a good job. <laughs> you know, I was like, I had a few different choices and I was like, well, I think when that comes on, you know, when you're, 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 you're out on the piss and that comes on in a, in a nightclub, the whole room just knows what's coming. It's the anticipation, yeah. the build, the build, the build, the build. And when it pops in to, you know, when it goes into that pocket straight after that, it's just amazing. And, and, it reminds me of a few different things. It reminds me of being uh, of, of being out, but it also reminds me of um, of being like at a uh, a wedding with my dad. It's, you know, this wedding songs. Oh, it's a B52's. real wedding classic. Oh, it is. But it's, it's, it's the B52s "Love Shack." It's it's all of those songs that I can imagine my dad in my head. I know exactly how he danced to it. He dances the same to every single song, and um, uh, <laughs> yeah, like that's the the song that gets everyone moving. And I think it, as soon as you hear the, that. Uh, that kind of, um, the, the kind of male, all male choir, it's kind of a barbershoppy part, like over the top of that, the build, the build to that. It's just the, the anticipation of the drop coming in. Just amazing, it's such a, such a great drop. We actually did our homage to it on this record. We just did it on a song called uh, Thorns of Love, um, where I had Hannah layer up loads of vocals in a similar manner to pop into um, this kind of doo wop thing we were doing. But it's just amazing, it's taking like a classic trope, isn't it? And, and, and reimagining it for, for pop music. Uh, that's, what they, that's what Bowie was doing there. It's so cool, like what a great intro. I mean, this question I'm really interested to ask you, um, Will, is because I, I ask all musicians this, and, and, and generally, um, 
uh, a lot of the guests that I've had on here, um, uh, I would say, are clearly older than you. Uh, and so you've very much grown up in a, in, in a generation that has, has been, you know, music has been driven by things like MySpace and the evolution of Spotify and, and, and things like that. So what I want to ask you is, um, which I ask all musicians, is when you approach songwriting and predominantly the intro, how much has that changed over the time your band's been going and what are the considerations now when you're creating an intro in regards to the way that people listen to music now it's a very loaded question bear with me um how how people listen to music now in regards to you know are you writing with radio as a consideration and with spotify you know there's so many things that distract you from the song you're listening to like you might like this you might like this are you aware is it a consideration that you should hook them quickly i think like that's like a <clears throat> like a very pop music thing um to yeah. do like that uh and when my band started out uh we were uh, the punk band you know um so we, we, we wouldn't have paid any attention to that at all uh for the first few years but uh that's because we were just trying to we, we were learning how to write songs still um i think now i absolutely think about every part of the song we speak about um when we're playing about serving the song instrument a lot of instruments uh, and not, not overplaying guitar not overplaying on drums etc etc but also like the structure of a song. Me and Ian used to do this thing, we used to call the song snake. And um, it was a series of post-it notes you put up. And so it, it meant that like, you could change around the structure of a song uh, like really, really quickly. So you'd have intro, verse, you know, the, the, the classic structure, but uh, intro, verse, chorus, you know, bridge, whatever, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus, ends, you know. Um, uh, but you can move it, move it around all the time. But intro is, uh, is one of the things that I've always think, I think as time's gone on, it's become more and more important to me, not necessarily to hook them quick, uh, although that does, does play a part in some of us, our more recent material. Um, but on our last record, our record opened, um, the intro to the, the actual whole album, and the, the intro to the, the, the first song, Black Rain, was a spoken word piece over the top of um, uh, some, some, uh, some piano and some organ and some uh, a choir in the background. And I think like setting the tone and, and preparing people, preparing the listener for what's about to come, like, like conditioning the listener for what's about to come in the song. The intro is a very, very important part of that. Um, in terms of like pop music and stuff, the song Cyanide we've just done, it starts with, um, with the hook uh, on, on, the, on the piano. And the idea is that you repeat something enough times, you know, during, over the course of a song, that, that's like an earworm that gets caught in your head. And yeah. I, even when I was writing it, it was driving me crazy. I've heard it so many times now. Um, uh, but 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 I love I love the idea of that I love the idea of hooking them like that. But I think um, I think that you're very right in, in um, like I, I guess some of the points you're making like in the question. Um, people, you have you basically have a few seconds to hook someone's attention. Now we have the shortest attention span for music than I can remember. Um, when I was a kid, we were still going to H and B on the day a record came out, buying it and consuming it on my my disc moon on the way home on the bus. You know. Um, long gone are those days. Um, we don't even have a HMV in, in Southampton anymore. And um, is it, we, they have any record stores here? It's, it's crazy. No, I don't know where you buy a CD on the high street here. Um, so it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Like you kind of have to get to get, get in quick because there's more music than ever. People can make music, good sounding records and productions at home. And, and you can put something on the internet. Um, so if, if people are gonna give you a try, they, they're spoiled for choice. So they're not often they don't give you very long at all. It's it's really interesting you ask that. One of the other things is like there's a producer in America I met, John Feldman. When we would play him songs, he'd only listen up to the chorus and then he'd be switched song like all the time. That's how he'd kind of identify if we did demos and things. Wouldn't listen further. Well, that's interesting. Really? Yeah. So you know, with that kind of listen to a bit of that, listen to a bit of that, and and the fact that now so many people. Um, we just go on iTunes and cherry pick, you know, the, a couple of singles rather than buy the album. When you've put this album together, do you still have a traditional approach to putting a, a record together that it is a body of work, is a piece of art, as you know, in regards to you know the track listing, you know, you know, is it something that you're, you're, you know, you're keen to sort of present your your album as as a body of work. I think, like, to be honest with you, like, I'm a really unlikely mu musician. Like, I, I, I wanted to make films. Um, I, yeah. I always wanted to make movies when I was a kid. So, and the records that really 
I loved when I was a kid, like my favorite albums that you can probably guess them, like you know anything about like uh, the stuff I grew up on. Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, obviously it was a massive record for me. And those felt like kingdoms, you know, um, when you listen to them. And, and so the way things are structured and narrative and, and, and pacing of a record and uh, that stuff to me is it, like, that's, I hold that above every, almost everything else. Um, Sometimes I have to be to told to make something more, more, more suitable for the radio, I think. Um, because I just, I, it's just not the way I grew up digesting music. Um, when I first got into music, I inherited my dad's record collection. Um, and so would listen to vinyl, like the same way my dad did. I, I was digesting music the same way my parents did back when they were kids. Um, and the idea of listening to the whole thing and then turning the record over and listening to the other side and the ceremony of that and... and, and uh, and uh, like that, that feeling is, is still in me to this day. I, 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 I struggle to, to um, the, with, with the, the high rate of p p releases people are doing, people are throwing out music to be relevant. And I know that's an important thing. I know I probably should adapt to that a little bit more, but I struggle with it. I, I, feel, like, I feel like even when I was a kid, I, was, I, had, I had an old school approach, but now in, in, my, in my 30s, I still I, I, feel like I think it's even more dated in a way. Like I, I, just, I want to take a, a year out to make a record. I want, I want to be able to reimagine and, and, and redesign everything. And so, yeah, I, I, I think um, I much, I much more see it in like a long, a long form rather than a short single. I, I struggle with singles. Okay. Well, you know, talking about sort of parents record collections and, and things like that leads us on nicely to track two. Um, well, what was the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you? It's difficult for me because I, I had a few different um, I had a few different answers for this one. Um, like so, it's, it, like it's, it's like one of those questions where like I don't know. It's like like I, I didn't know whether to answer answer it whether like with the first song that I found for me um, that had an you, you can, you can on have me. some honourable mentions. You can throw a few in. Okay, so uh, there's there, there's a few I think um, for me. I'm gonna go first. I'm gonna say Roxy music more than this. I think. Uh, that song, like, is it, it's a pop song, but it's a, it's what a sad song that is. Like, what a truly like devastating song that is. And it's actually heightened as I got old, older when you see that scene in Lost in Translation, um, you know, where, where Bill Murray sings sings it on karaoke. And I remember thinking, because my dad was the biggest Roxy Music fan, we actually did a Roxy Music cover when we first started, uh, Made of Ale, nice. um, because of my because for my dad, you know, like, uh, and I just grew up with all that stuff. He, he's been to see Brian Ferry loads of times, and. Um, yeah, so for, so for me, uh, th that song, like, like, I remember just thinking like, how incredible the lyrics were and the composition, like it, it's, and the way that Brian sings is so outrageous. There's that incredible Bob Dylan covers record he did, um, yeah. Dylan S. And uh, like, just the, the, look at the timbre of his voice from that, like, it's just crazy. Like, uh, how do you get that sound out of a human? It's, it's mad, the control. Um, so yeah, that's that one. I I, I think I um I think my original one was was AFI um the, the punk band and and I, I would have gone for Morning Star, um when I was doing that because that was the first band that I found that was a band that wasn't handed to me. I got into rock and metal when I was a kid uh because my 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 older cousin gave it to me. You know they they gave me their records. My my the very the the very starting point for music was given to me by my father. Um, but then the, getting into alternative music was given to me by my older cousin. And when I found AFI, that was my first discovery. You know, that was just purely me. That was my band. You know, I'm sure you have those bands as well. Um, and that song is the, at the end of The Art of Drowning, um, and, uh, which is an incredible punk rock record. It's uh, really seminal, I think, that when they really perfected that sound. Um, right on the end, a ballad. Um, and uh, weird to have a, like a, a, punk, a fast punk band. But I got into because they sounded like the Offspring at first, um, yeah. and and you can't imagine them like the Offspring doing doing Morning Star. It's such a beautifully written song, um, and Davey does this kind of he's he, he's he went really really Danzig back in kind of like um, on All Hallows EP and and uh, into uh, into Black Stars and the Sunset, um, but that that song in particular, he's he's, he's started to develop a real range um, with his voice. It was uh, really really powerful. He can sing really high, but it's really controlled. And the, the amazing placement about that as well is like after a record that's like as over the top and it's and, and, and it at such a blisteringly fast pace as that album does, you have this kind of respite at the end, which I've always loved. I've, I feel like I've been a sucker for it ever since Rock and Roll Suicide, you know, um, and just that grand ballad, the, the climax, the crescendo of the whole thing. And he's, he's, sing, he's singing in such a reserved way, like, like through his teeth almost at the beginning, after hearing him yell for yeah. <laughs> 40 minutes. And I just, yeah, 
I always remember that. I remember making like weird little art films um, when I was a kid and using that as a soundtrack for them, you know, just people walking through the woods and stuff in black and white on my mum's handy cam. <laughs> so what was the, what was, I'm curious to know what the emotion would have been that you felt. So um, at, with, with Morningstar, I think um, I probably, like, the thing about Davy Havoc's lyrics is it's very interpretive, um, especially around that period of time where he was like, writing with uh, was an incredible lyricist. He was writing really art uh, articulately and using words, I had to use a dictionary to, to look up. So for me, I think at the time I'd moved to schools um, and I'd, uh, I moved to Southampton and I, hadn't, I didn't have very many friends to be told. And I think that's you know, something that's kind of really a, a bit of really formative period of time because of that. I, I, I kind of made friends with records and with music instead. And as so many of us do. And um, I remember, being very sad and very lonely at the time like it was I was I was living at, um it, with my brother my mum worked like crazy hours and to, to support us um she worked for the NHS and she'd be out and working in London and um just coming home super late and um so I didn't have that many people around and especially like uh I think it kind of um it, it kind of so it was a really soothing piece of kind of something gentle and soft when i was probably quite angry as well and so like a lot of the music i was listening to was very uh, dramatic and angry but it was like the first time um i would sit on the, the school bus on the way to school and listen to that and when we get to that part it kind of allowed me to be sad it was like, the only the only sad music i would really listen to at that time you got to remember this is a time where everyone was listening to limp biscuit you know like uh, um and uh, new metal that all that stuff was going on so like there, there was kind of um there was male fragility in that, in some of that music, but it wasn't anywhere near on the scale of what was going on with this say a five song. It was um, it was really really speaking to me. Um, and you know uh, the, the 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 refrain is um, am I you're anything? You know am I the star? Um, am I the star beneath the stairs? Am I the ghost upon the stage? Am I you're anything? And I mean it just speaks to every single teenager ever, doesn't it? You know this is the classic stuff, the classic tropes mm -hmm. of these uh, of this genre. Um, but it was just really beautifully written, really articulate. Um, and performed by a man um, who was effeminate, and I was an effeminate little weird art kid. And uh, so this was like, and for, when I didn't have many friends, and I, and, I, and I felt so sad quite a lot of the time, this was like a, a place I could go, and a place that existed for me inside a record. And when you realize that there, there are, are these worlds inside these albums, that's when you really start loving music, and that's when you fall in love with this. And that's the problem, this is why I can't stop doing this. <laughs> it's wrecked my whole life, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm still here doing it because of that reason, I think. Well, let's stay here um, for, for, because track three, I'm going to ask you the song that reminds you of your time at school. Yes. Uh, so I picked for this one um, Armageddon by Alkaline Trio, which is like the, the other half of, um, of the AFI puzzle, isn't it? Um, yes. You know, this, all this stuff happened at, at a very similar time. Um, they were the two... They were the two bands that, like, any band... Like, I met my first girlfriend going to the Joiner's Arms to go to a gig. I used to sneak out my mum's house and get on the train and go into town and go to gigs at the Joiner's. And I remember uh, my first girlfriend seeing her in Subway on East Street here in Southampton. And she was, at the time, she was wearing an Alkaline Trio hoodie with the big pair of scissors at the side, the zip-up one. <clears throat> and instantly I was like, oh god she's amazing who's that girl and then and then we ended up being together for like almost a decade that me and that girl and we're still like best mates now like it's funny i made all my friends around this time going out getting drunk you know like the shit you do when you're a kid like kind of sat in a park drinking vodka straight like i'd never do that now you know like you know, why wouldn't you do that drinking frosty jacks at the bottle down by the park you know getting in a fight with some kids from from down the road or, like that sort of thing but this this band was my whole soundtrack to that part of my life um and like every teen romance, every like late night night out, every car trip to see bands, this is one of those records. Good morning, the um the Apple and Trio album, is uh is I just hear my youth in that record. It's so funny because you had AFI that were like this this goth punk band, you had, you had Apple and Trio this goth punk band, but the two didn't really mix much more than the fact that you'd call them a goth punk band. They were they yeah. were make up, like they're from two different spe they're different spectrums of of, of punk. Yeah, so Apple and Trio come from the hot water music uh like uh, kind of the, the lawrence arms the kind of more kind of get drunk and, and do drugs uh, like uh, that sort of culture meanwhile you've got davy having an afi from the hardcore scene straight edge people who don't do any of that stuff and uh they're, they're, they're very different types of music different paces but this one i picked this one in particular because it's the only song um this uh, this song is from uh this is uh 
um, from from here to infirmary, and it's the only song on the record with uh, a double time beat at the end. And so we loved it. We were waiting. We were waiting for this song. And uh, Derek, the drummer from Alkaline Trio, is one of the best drummers you'll ever see. He's absolutely outrageous. I remember going to see Alkaline Trio um, in Exeter once, and I got I got to work the show. And my my friend was like, "Oh, we're putting it on Alkaline Trio. Do you want to come load some some gear?" I was like, "Yes, I do." And I watched them on the side of the stage, and I watched them. Um, Skiba turned around and he had, a, he had a, a, a roadie just filling up little glasses of uh, uh, little shots of, of, of whiskey for him. And he'd, he'd go over to him. I was standing next to him. And he'd, and he'd go over to him and lick his lips going, oh, like that. So, so the guy needed to fill it up again. And what that meant was every time he was doing that, the band, the band had to be carried. And the drummer just carried them through this like, like it was nothing. So he stopped playing guitar, did a shot of whiskey. And I was just like, wow, like no matter... What happens up front with the two, the two amazing front men, these amazing musicians? It, it, like Matt's obviously get, having one of the nights. The drummer's keeping this all together. And you kind of realize the value in the rhythm section and, and how, like, the, how important and prominent that, that uh, a good bass player and a good drummer are. Yeah. That's the foundation of the entire band. And, uh, a bit amazing, yeah. Late nights, driving around, uh, hanging out, going to our country, bunking off college to go and watch them at the Guildhall. Um, and uh, yeah. Just amazing. I, 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 it's funny actually. Um, I met Skiba like years later, and um, he was really nice to me. Um, I, like, I met him when I was a kid, you know, getting your autograph and all that. And um, I met him like at the at the Kerrang Awards, and uh, and um, he came up to I came up to him and I introduced myself and everything. And he said, "Oh yeah, like I've heard about you guys. Isn't, then your band sound a bit like Alkaline Trio and Meatloaf." I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> That's kind of you got it in a nutshell, there, mate. That's kind of what we sound like. <laughs> Um, how, how was school? Did you enjoy it? No, I hate school. Everyone says it's the best years of your life, and it's just rubbish nonsense. Um, I also don't. I'm not, I realised um, that I'm not very good at being taught things, um, and I know that sounds like a horribly horrible thing. I'm the eldest child, so of course, you know, you can't tell me anything, um, and that's that's my own my own problem. But I don't learn very well that way. I'm not very good at being like taught things when I'm interested in something. I can zero in on it and, and, and extract so much information and spend and concentrate so firmly. Well, when I read, when I'm resonates reading, resonates so much. I, I, oh, really? I've, I've, I've interviewed about 150 people on this podcast, and they're all creatives, and so many of them have echoed exactly what. Oh, you're that saying. makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> you're not alone. You're not alone, mate. <laughs> it's um, it's a funny thing. Um, so, like I'm really glad you said that. Like sometimes I worry about it. I'm like, you know, um, it's uh, it's just. Like my girlfriend says to me all the time, you go through, you go through these phases, Will. You get into something for like intensely for for a month, and 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 you want to want to talk about that to me every single day. And then the next month, you're not you're never going to speak about that ever again. You're going to move on to one other thing, and that's going to be your thing for the entire. And that's kind of how things go, like with me. Um, but I but I struggle. I've always struggled with um with, with learning like that. I often wonder if um we're at the right age to be learning and getting up early and uh, at that point in time. Like, I think like my brain's, I know, it's, you know it shouldn't be that way, but I think I get, I'm more susceptible to, uh, to and want to learn about science and things now than I did in school. I just wanted to play with wrestling toys, you know, like that's, <laughs> like, you know, I wanted to make up storylines for my wrestlers and I wanted to watch movies. I didn't want to be there, like, you know, learning what the mean, medium and mode is, you know, <laughs> like, what, what? Yeah. that's never helped me. Like, uh, so yeah, I didn't like it. I, I didn't have um, many friends. Uh, I uh, spent a lot of time listening to music and, and making art, little arty films. And I was like, oh, is this sure I was going to go into film? That was what, that's what that's where what I wanted to, to do. Myself. You wanted to be a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, I did want to be a singer. Like, uh, I love watching bands, but I was never, I had a big, I, I got beaten up really bad one time um, in Emsworth uh, um, in Portsmouth. And uh, it, I developed like a real stutter. And I still speak really fast now, but it's taken years to get to get rid of it. Um, so, like the idea of getting on stage and speaking to to a crowd of people would just seem impossible to me. I, I was much more comfortable being behind the scenes and, and and being a creative working on something than being at the front of something, which is so weird to tell to, to, to say. But um, did you not like yeah, attention just, then, as a young man? Oh yeah, I loved attention, but like, and I acted out, and I was a nightmare. But like. Not like a, a, not to perform, you know. Like that wasn't really. Um, I was like a, a, somebody made things a lot, and yeah. um, it, like, I just didn't see myself doing doing that. I, like, I loved it, like, and I, and I idolized singers. I loved the idea of of um, of the front man. But I, w I I never had singing lessons, you know. I never. I I didn't learn music. I didn't go to to music school. Um, 
I just literally fell into doing this because I love punk so much. And um, it's a really weird story about how I ended up doing this. Um, I, uh, I was a promoter um, and I was basically putting little DIY gigs when I was in, in, in the punk scene in Southampton. And um, the, one of the bands called up one day and said, like, to my mum's house, back when landlines were a thing. And uh, I picked up the phone and they were like, oh, it was, it was Chris from a band called Our Time Down Here. And he said, Will, our singers, we've kicked our singer out. I said, oh, shit, you're not going to be able to play the gig then. And he goes, oh, no, I know that you've, you've played in things, some things over the years with school bits. Would you do it? And I was like, oh, God, it seems quite narcissistic to put on a gig and then play the gig, you know. <laughs> but um, I ended up doing it. And I was just, because all my mates, anyway, we always swapped members from different bands over the years. Um, did it at the Firehouse in Southampton here, a metal pub down here. And, um, and they were like, oh, that was all right, wasn't it? Just, just do it some more. And so we did. And that was seven years gone. <laughs> seven years of working at one stop and Domino's Pizza and selling love film in the street to support this weird little band we did. I had no direction. It wasn't, we were never trying to get signed. It was never, never anything like that. We just made things. And, uh, and then I ended up just being the singer from this band. And uh, then like, we stopped doing it because it was, it was, it, I was still in my dad's house and it was kind of a bit unfair on everybody. Tried to have a real job for a bit. Hated that, you know. Real jobs are rubbish. They are like they're, I yeah, can't they're well do it. Mate. They are, they really are. Like and um, you know, I preferred like I tried to get like a, like a call center job, you know, like business professional, um, and uh, and and not work at not work hustling things on the street that paintball paintball trials and things that I used to be doing, um, charity stuff and all that this nonsense. I did for years and years. Um, uh, anyway, hated that. Called up and said, I don't want to tour ever again. Um, we were about 24 at the time. And I, I said, but I don't want to do this. I don't want to tour ever again because it, it financially destroyed us. And it was a nightmare and everyone involved. <laughs> um, but like, can we do a band for the weekends? Ricky's going to put a ba- an American band will come through. They'll, they'll let us open up for, for one of those bands. And then we did it. And that was the band that got signed. And then I was forced back into it. <laughs> it's pulled me back in. So, uh, so You only yeah, play weekends though, right? Oh yeah, exactly. You can only put me at the weekends. In fact, you can put me any time. I'm doing nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, track four. What was the first record you remember buying? Well, it wasn't a record, was it? It would have been a CD. It was a CD, and I know exactly what it was. It was uh, Mechanical Animals, um, Marilyn Manson. Um, it was uh, my cousin had got me into Marilyn Manson. He was like well into new metal. We went, we went to a Catholic school, and. Uh, he, he's called uh, I'm not a slave to a god that doesn't exist on his, on his backpack in, in Tipex and wore it to school. I remember it being like an op war. Um, uh, the Marilyn Manson lyrics. That's Marilyn pretty Manson was fucking punk number- at a Catholic school. <laughs> yeah, sick, isn't it? I remember thinking he was a badass. I was never that daring. I could never have done that. Um, he, was just, he was really cool. I looked up to him a lot. He got me into a lot of music. Um, he was very, really arty, very quiet, a lot quieter than me. Um, as you can tell, I talk a lot and it's, uh, it's a nightmare. Everyone wants me to shut up all the time. Um, but yeah, he was a like a lovely, a lovely, lovely bloke, um, Adam, my older cousin, and I just I saw Marilyn Manson and I saw David Bowie. I was that's what I saw, and I saw that album cover. I was like, oh, this this, this is something I absolutely understand. I I, I know this music because I spent ten thousand hours listening to these records on my own in in, in my mum's house, putting on my mum's makeup in the mirror um, to try and look like David Bowie. You know, like uh, I used to do that all the time. Weird, all that stuff you do when you're a kid, and now I do literally do that for a living. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like, uh, and, and my, my mum was sure I was uh, I was gay, and, and she was only half half right there. Uh, but um, it, it's uh, it's just it's funny, all that stuff. So the makeup and all the, the drama and, and the um, and the um, the playing of gender and um, uh, all of that stuff was stuff that was right up the, the front of my mind. I knew it so well, and I bought it. And I loved it. I thought it was absolutely amazing. Um, what a, an, an incredible um, album! Uh, I, I had the, the version with the, the blue cover, uh, the, 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 the you know the um, the jewel case, the blue cover, yeah. and you could run you could run the um, the album art underneath, and secret messages would come up because it was blue and it would pop out. And it was just the attention to detail to what he did and how manicured the whole thing was, um, and his evolution. Uh, he was doing a Bowie again. He was doing Madonna, you know, one of those shapeshifters. And um, what I always thought was really interesting about Marilyn Manson was that he wasn't a very good singer. He was always been an awful singer, like, uh, but he's an incredible creative. So I saw, I guess I saw a lot of myself in him as well. Uh, I was like, oh, wow, this guy's just got loads of ideas. Like he's head and shoulders above and, and, and so far beyond everybody else. He's, yeah, everyone's saying he's Alice Cooper, 
and he is that to a degree. But it's also incredibly, there's a lot more nuance than Alice Cooper. There's a lot more going on here um, than just great songs and, and, and you know, um, cutting someone's head off on stage. There was a lot of political statements he was making of his music. And, um, and I really responded to that. That was something that really, really spoke to me. And I remember like how much like Coma White reminds you of a David Bowie song and, uh, and uh, you know, Speed of Pain or, 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 or that song that was so varied and so different. And still a metal record. You metal mates that liked, like in Judas Priest and stuff, still kind of kind of got on with Marilyn Manson. He was all right, you know. And um, yeah, but the indie kids, cool. you know, the indie kids were like, could see the Bowie, could see the, you know, could could, could see the art, artistry that 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 transcended beyond just the, you know, just beyond you know the genre of metal as well. I think it, but Marilyn Manson for me, you know, the, I, I guess he come through maybe just. Around, the, or I suppose he came around in the time of new metal, wasn't it? That that that, that he come to the sort of forefront, really. With but what was, was Sweet Dreams first, and then yes, on, uh, on uh, smells like smells like children. On, on, yeah. on, um portrait of an American family. Which yeah. I can't really recall. And and, and I remember like I, I, I DJ in, uh, and, and I have always DJed in, in alternative venues, and and the impact that that had. And I remember sort of you know you, you can fast track it when it's a cover, so instantly people know Sweet Dreams anyway. Um, but then when he dropped Beautiful People, it was like, fuck me, what Out, is this? Outrageous, like, outrageous and, song. And just that, the, you know, I can hear Nine Inch Nails in that, I can hear so much stuff that, you know, as a 47 year old man, but so many different bands that I'd grown up listening to, I just thought, Marilyn Manson's a fucking clever geezer. He's, he's literally just harnessed so much cool stuff and then packaged it with the most exciting looking, persona that with every album just evolved and like shape shifted and and I'll tell you what I'll tell you a little story that at, at the time it was just before my band got signed and we went to see a major label and and we was doing quite kind of I guess post grunge kind of anthemic kind of alternative rock I guess whatever you'd call it but quite grown up sound and this is the era of like Radiohead and things like that and I remember sitting in the label, uh, the label office, I won't say what label he was, but he was one of the big majors. And, and I went, you know, what do you think? He went, well, yeah, we like the songs, but to be honest, like, do you think, and he held up a picture of my band, and he went, do you think people want like rock music with guys that just kind of look like this, which was us just dressed in jeans and tees, or do you think they're gonna be interested in this and held up? Kerrang with Marilyn Manson on the cover, who was the next big thing. And I was like, yeah, I get that. Like, wow. Like, Man, I mean, it was, it was all, a kick in the dick. But like, all that know. ever, like, that, like, I, that's, that, like I, I'd love to hear some more stories from, from but, like, I bet you got some amazing ones from that time. Like, because that era of the music industry, especially the alternative music industry, just fascinates me because I was a kid when that was going on. Um, mm. And that was all the stuff I read and all the stuff I ingested. And now seeing it from this side of the fence, years later, it's, it's a different world now to, to how it was back then. I think it was but like so every now and again, someone from a Kerrang will tell me something and I'll be like, wow, like, it's so and cool. It, and it was so weird that when you look at the track, you know, how, how that alternative music scene evolved from, you know, Kurt basically and, and Nirvana just going, right, this cock rock thing, that's got to go. And, you know, and then, you know, when Nirvana come along dressed in ripped jeans, you know, lumberjack shirts, uh, no one cared for Guns N' Roses, Skid Row, Motley Crue at yeah. that point. No one cared. It was like, it weren't about image. It was about Kurt and Nirvana and Pearl Jam and these bands that just, it was about the music. And then it's weird how that then started to kind of, when that finished, it went back to people wanting glamour, wanting something really iconic to, to look at. And when you look at Marilyn Manson, he delivered that. You know, he's got every bit of angst and anger that, that Kurt had, that Axel had, and like, but he then just threw in Bowie and Mark Bolan and T and, and uh, Nine Inch Nails, and then you just got this, I'm wittering on now, I'm sorry, Will, I know this is your- No, 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 I literally love hearing it, like, this is but stuff it is that I weird care how about. it evolved into that, and, and, and I, just- I always think that, like, I, I literally was just saying the other day, like, in, in some interview, uh, I was saying how, I feel like a lot of the time with, with my band on a much smaller scale, the, the reason that like, I think we got a chance and got given a shot was because at the time, like my camera had broken up. Uh, like that was, that was, that had happened quite a while ago. 
and everyone had gone to, to be in, in kind of quite straight up hardcore bands in, in, our, in our scene. It was, it was a little bit more straight up again. I think that the pendulum sways constantly back and forth. You know, think about when the, 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 the glam rock stuff was killed off, then the LA kind of uh, hair metal scene getting killed off. It, it, it kind of ebbs and flows, it flip flops back and forth. This theatrical, the theatricality in this music. Um, but certainly Manson, my God, because he had the perfect face for it as well. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. an actual face. He had those big lips and he was like, he would always just looked like he was from another world anyway. And, he, and the transition, I, I bet you remember it really well, um, from Antichrist Superstar to Mechanical Animals, where he went from this being like this, literally looking like the devil. Um, and that's what, how he was perceived in middle America at the time, you know? He was public enemy number one well, to I mean, being an alien. Like to yeah. be, he, he transformed and himself into an alien. And, and, and what was brilliant was, and uh, you know, he was the Antichrist. And, and I don't know if you've seen the film Bowling for Columbine. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the line he says in that, because everybody was blaming shock rocker Marilyn Manson. For, yeah, I know. For, you know, that these lads just, who obviously were quite unwell, done these horrendous things. And just when that news reporter says to Manson, like, what would you have done if you could have spoke to him? And he said, nothing, I would have listened to him. And now you just think, fuck, man, that's a great I know. answer, man. I think that, that's like, like one of my favourite uh, things, like, especially this, this is the problem. Like, so I, I'm such a big fan of Manson, especially around those three records, ho going to Hollywood. And there's a handful of, of uh, amazing news footage from that time when he was, uh, also when he, he appeared on Jerry Springer and, oh, was it Jerry Springer? One of those yeah. American talk shows. And um, he just outwits everybody. He was so yeah. much more intelligent than everyone who was trying to critique him. And he, again, always two steps ahead of everybody. Like, like to be able to, like, like that, that, that one line in that film, like, for me, that's one of my favourite parts of that whole, that whole film. I think it's yeah. such an important thing. He was so much more in tune with the youth yeah. and the people who were trying to, trying to tear him down for it, the older generation. Yeah. Um, but now, I don't know whether he's kind of... Um, he's entered that older generation now. There's a new... Uh, you, know, you know, like, it, it's, it's a... A different that's it kind of kind of happens, doesn't it? So, uh, what records do you make when you're no longer part of of, of, uh, of youth culture anymore? You know, you but become like, Bowie. You become Bowie. You just constantly yeah. evolve. You constantly evolve. And then... I think so. That's what you should do too. But maybe he's like like I don't know. What what are you felt of, of his late recent uh, recent efforts? It's not. It's not really something I get overly excited about. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm more interested in him as a person than his music nowadays. You know, if there's ever an interview with him, I'm 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 on board. I'm interested, um, but musically, it doesn't it doesn't scream at me anymore. You know, I speak to to, to Dan Carter quite a lot about. Um, he's you know, a very he's, good like, friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, I love him. Um, and uh, we we call each other and talk about chaos magic all the time. Recently, I'm trying to do a radio one thing the other day. Is end up talking about magic on air. It's, it's about like, 10, oh, 10 minutes down the road. I, I know, I know, and I try to stop myself. But um, yeah, he, uh, he he's brilliant, Dan, and. Um, he knows Manson really well. Um, they text each other. I, I keep thinking to myself, well, every time he says that to me, imagine getting a text from Marilyn Manson. <laughs> like, how, how insane is that? You know? It's mm -hmm. like when Ricky Gervais made friends with David Bowie and mm -hmm. they would just hang out after he, he, he'd, he'd done a, a David Bowie pastiche in, in another life, you know? Yeah. And now they were just friends. Um, love it. It's so, that's, that's absolutely bizarre, isn't it? Fact five, Will. The song that soundtracked your years clubbing. Oh, this one is against me. Pints of Guinness make you strong. Um, so this is another side. I don't, I don't speak about how important against me were half, half as much as I should do. Against me, I was like a militant DIY punk kid when I was, uh, when I was younger. Um, I was like, you know, it's, it's so funny. I've ended up on a major label. <laughs> I've really sold out. But um, it, like when I was a kid, I was like really, really... Um, Really into kind of anarcho punk and, and, and those scenes. Like, uh, Southampton was like an like amazing, amazing place for that. There were so many cool bands, so many house shows going on all the time. I was a big part of that scene. And a lot, a lot of the way I found myself there was through Against Me. Um, I can't remember exactly how I found them. I think I may have seen like an older band. Um, there's always like this kind of, when you get into music, there's always the older kids playing in, in, in local bands. You look up to them, you know. Um, I had loads of them down here. Jets vs. Sharks were, were mine. Um, they were this amazing band from Portsmouth. Sounded like grade, uh, you know, like uh, that sort of era of music. Really cool, like a, a hardcore band, but with that kind of, um, I don't know, like, uh, kind of like some of that Jade Tree stuff in there. Um, mm. uh, it was really, really cool. Um, 
And I, saw, I, must have saw, I think I saw the drummer wearing an Against Me shirt. And I was like, I need to check this band out. And we said, that's how we used to find bands. On T-shirts, yeah, on the back totally. of CDs. Who, they, who, who are they thanking in their album? You know, like, and yeah. going by the records like that. And I remember me and my girlfriend at the time, Kay, went to FM Music in the, in the Bargate Centre here. That's, that's, none of this is here anymore. They've literally bulldozed that to the ground. Um, but like, uh, we went in there, independent records, and we, uh, we bought one album each. And she got As the Eternal Cowboy, and I got Reinventing Outs Rose. And it just changed everything. It changed like, the politics on it, the way they spoke about uh, Reinventing Axl Rose as an album is about reinventing the conventional rock star. Um, and a lot of that, uh, the, the ethics talking about touring in a DIY scene just made you want to be in a DIY punk band. And, and, and uh, Pints of Guinness starts with this amazing uh, kind of snare roll you get going into it. And it's just got this chorus, the, the gang vocals on that. Gang vocals have always been like, such a part of some of my favorite punk records ever. This like a, a choir, because that's what a show is, you know? It's just people jumping on each other and singing. And, um, and the, the, the chorus for that, you know, just like James, I'll be drinking Irish tonight. Um, at, like that, when that first comes in, it's just so anthemic. I was obsessed and I still am. Like Laura Jane Grace is uh, such an inspiration to me. Um, and has been for years and years and years. She actually shouted my band out last year when we were in, the, we were in a social media blackout for one of these stunts we were doing. And so I couldn't respond to it, but I was freaked out. Absolutely. Um, such a massive fan. And it reminds me, there used to be a nightclub down here. I don't know if you ever came to, to, to Unit, but it was before, it was just after Nexus closed down down here. Um, I don't know if you ever DJed there, but it was a free, free floor club um, of alternative music, which obviously would never work now, um, but like it did at the time. I don't know why. Yeah. And um, Ricky used to, um, he, he does the joiners now, one of my best friends, he used to run the middle bar. And I used to go there and get absolutely out of my mind. And it was so much fun. Because he was in control of the music on that floor as well. Yeah. And we would, we would put on that. And all of me and my friends would just sing along to that. I would reach over his bar and, 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 and pour myself a glass of wine. He'd go, stop doing that. Stop doing that. <laughs> and there was just all of those nights out where you're just getting really crazy. And... Um, you know, the Joiners owned this, this, this nightclub and the Joiners um, Arms down here is our grassroots music venue. Um, something I'm incredibly proud of and, and played a really prominent part of, of, of my life. Um, my, they're my family, you know, um, all, the, all the people who own it and uh, love them. Uh, so like, oh, I have so many amazing memories of being in their establishments, dancing to Against Me, singing along uh, and, and just getting really, really drunk. It's drinking music and, and that's, that's what that this is. And it's, it's, it's kind of fuck the system, proper like, proper punk rock it's recorded the way the way it sounds it couldn't be produced better even though it's not got that major label sheen that they would go on with when, when they signed a sire um it's just amazing it's, it's just is what it is it sounds like what you're at when you're at one of those shows i remember going to uh, i think it's the mean fiddler they shot it, shot it. Even, even mean fiddler it was the mean fiddler not he's not there anymore either rest in peace the mean fiddler mm -hmm. in the story um to see against me uh, record their a, a live um a live album uh and uh, it was one of the first times I saw them. I, I, I've seen them so many times over the years, but they were absolutely magic. It was just crazy. The whole room felt like it was unified, you know? You know when you can hear everyone around you singing? And it's like, oh my God, this is like, the, this is what punk rock is to me. It's all these people with the same values and ideas and, and ethics. I mean, music about questioning the world around you, about, uh, you know, um, animal liberation, um, talking about... Um, like it was, it, it taught me so much. Like being kind of just uh, like like a, a guy from an all white school, like to be just challenging you as well. Like the, like that's what punk rock always was to me. It was about questioning the way I was and the way I looked at the world and um, like racism. And it, like yeah, we're talking loads about that at the moment, obviously with everything that's going on. But you know, the punk scene was discussing these things and and, and um, making people challenge themselves and challenge everything around them. For, with uh, in my life for years and years and years, and it's. I think against me, a band that for getting me into the, into that scene in the first place, it, that scene would change my whole life, my whole outlook and everything. And uh, a lot of that was um, also in the evenings, just a drunken mess singing along to these songs. <laughs> All right, well let, let's let's stay in um, the, the, the home county because that's um, track six, a favourite song from an artist from your home county. So I've chosen a weird one for this one. Um, so me and Ian. This is the one uh, I didn't know. Yeah, you won't know this one because it's, it's, from a, it's from a local band down here. Um, so me and Ian used to play uh, in two separate bands. Our first tour, Ian Faison Creeper, obviously, uh, like he's a, the guitar player in my band. Uh, but we toured together our entire lives. We built our entire life together, our, our careers all 
built together. But it was never always like this. He used to play in a band called Take Em Out, which is the funniest name in the world. It's a terrible, terrible name. Um, Take Em Out. And it's back at the time that everyone was really into youth crew hardcore. And they sounded like Champion and a lot of those kind of Bridge Nine bands. Um, but our first tour together um, wasn't, we weren't playing in the same band. It Take Em Out toured and so did my band, Art I'm Down Here. This is back in 2009, I want to say, a long time ago. Um, and we didn't know anything about tour. We just put loads of gigs and, and, and went out and, and did them. Um, but like, we got, there was nine of us and we had two six-seater vans um, because that's what we could get. So we put the, all, the, all the gear in the back of one of them and the rest of us just laid down in the back of the van. The other van <laughs> just drove around the country playing all these gigs. Um, and they had this song called uh, We'll See It Through. Oh, I've lost you. They're back. No. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see it through. And it was uh, this ridiculous, kind of like a, it was just like an Americana style hardcore song. But everyone in our city knew that song. So when they play, everyone would dance, everyone would kind of pile on and get the mic. And it was like this song. Every single time uh, they play, and we're waiting for, for We'll See It Through. And it had this kind of, um, this kind of gang shout at the end. We'll see it through till the end it was like really shouty and really aggressive and really really fun everyone would jump and pile on at the last show which i put on um at the king alf a football pub uh, by st mary's down here um ian broke the headstock of his guitar because everyone jumped on him and it fell down he broke the entire headstock off so they couldn't even play the end of the song which is like the whole reason they were known but i have such fond memories of that song and growing up playing with ian it's it kind of how we met it's how our whole scene kind of came together down here for, for our little generation of, of hardcore and punk and um and it was just amazing it's it's like a, a really silly song uh, it's really it's really really fast it's very very much of that time period it's uh, very much of american hardcore um, rather than anything british uh, but like personally like on, on a personal level it, it holds a lot of weight with me and um and it's just a really really fun thing to remember all those nights going to gigs i used to put on like hardcore bands from all around the world so i used to put on like a bands from Europe and I put on like a Malaysian hardcore a straight edge band called um, Second Combat and Take Em Out would always be the support band and you know, they would all play, always play this song and the whole room would just go crazy for this one song every single time. So I've chosen that one because I felt like that was a really apt one. Also, I don't know, score points of Ian for mentioning his old band. So. Um. Wonderful. <laughs> That's great. All right, well for the last track, well you get to play DJ and, um, and recommend a song that many may not know that you would like them to hear. I chose a few here, but I've got in my notes, I'm just going to read the ones that I chose. Uh, can I choose a few? Oh, no, I, I'm actually happy with my choice for this one. Um, I chose uh, a song um, by a band that's actually got quite a, more, a lot more recognition now in, in like over the recent, recent years, but uh, um, I, by a band called Cold Cave. The song's called Glory. And uh, so Cold Cave is... Um, is the side project of um, Wes Isolt, who is um, the singer in American Nightmare. Uh, and, and give up the ghost later on. Um, he's just one of my favorite lyricists. I just think he's an, an incredibly creative guy. He inspires me uh, an awful amount. Um, and he went on to do this kind of, he was really into Sisters of Mercy and a lot of that, um, uh, a, lot, a lot of kind of electronic music. And uh, he was born with, with one hand. And um, so he couldn't play guitar. So he learned to play keyboards. Um, and uh, he, I think he's, for me, he's just the king. Like he's just the, the king of this stuff. He's nailed the aesthetic down and the branding of what, what he does is next level. He's, so, he's very well read. Um, he owns the Heartworm Press where he presses poetry books. And um, so he's, he's just a really, really wonderful writer, which I think he always was in American Nightmare too. But especially on this song, um, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful song. Some of it reminds me of like, kind of like a, a hero's David Bowie vibe. There's the, um, I, the lyric, I can, I can be you uh, and you can be me too. Uh, or whatever you know I could be you and you could be me too I just I just love it it makes me think of my girlfriend and it makes me really it's a love song and every time I hear that first beat come in uh, I just want to dance and I love this sort of music I got really into like kind of dark wave and a lot of uh, that sort of stuff comes along with um when you grow up listening to Marilyn Manson and AFI you know this is where we all wash up and <laughs> in the dark wave world when you get older um and uh where's is like the the, undoubtedly the king of um of that you know uh he's a guy that kind of his he, cold cave to me is so prolific that it almost um overshadows the uh, other stuff he's done which is already amazing i love it. american nightmare is my favorite hardcore band uh it's a uh, just a, a beautiful song 
he sings in that lovely baritone. Um, there's like uh, there's some records. He did that record "Cherish the Light Years," which is like a full length of this stuff, and it's a lot more kind of uh, poppy than some of this, uh, his other stuff. But I love that too. It's just amazing. The lyric uh, there's a really great lyric. Um, it's important. Um, it's important even evil people look so, look so good on the outside. And, and there's like, there's really clever wordplay. I've always wanted to write like that. And it's actually, I have to, I always, I have to be careful I don't too much because he sued Fall Out Boy for um, stealing his lyrics, did you remember? Oh, really? Um, yeah, so Under the Cork Tree. So uh, Wes is just this amazing lyricist. Like, it is amazing. When you read it, like, I've got a load of his poetry books. I'm, I'm, they're like some of my favorite things that I have. Um, and Deathbeds is um, is the, the main ones that like the anthology of a lot of the, his, his work from when he was in Some Girls and a lot of his writings. And um, he um, like under, under the cork tree, Fallout Boy, Fallout Boy have got some cool lyrics, but I think they they have a lot of their um, the writing style to it to as I sold um, so much so that uh, he, he got a lot of money um, from. Uh, from, 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 but because they literally lifted verses from his songs, and but they were all friends, they, they all grew up in the same scenes and things as well. Mm. But I think it got to a point where, like, he had to be um, made a, like, a, like a, a co writer on the songs, and I think he's made some, some good money off of that, which I'm really, really pleased that he's managed to do because um, I, I, I'm hoping that it assists with his with more, more, more creation from him. And I just, I'll just digest and buy anything he makes, really, because it's, it's, it's funny, you get to a certain point in your life, don't you, where certain people there's such a high quality of what they do that like you know it's going to be good even if it's not like your favorite thing they've done it's going to be better than what other people are doing and so you just buy it anyway <laughs> you know like that that's just kind of the way i am with it uh it is uh he's just an amazing amazing lyricist an amazing songwriter and um and i love this particular song it's a single and i um i just really really rate it like uh, I, I i grew up with the sister of mercy stuff as well and I, I grew up with a lot of uh like New Order and stuff like that. And a lot of the reference points he has really speak to me from, as I said earlier on, like going to records at my mum's house and finding all this music, this amazing stuff. And, uh, and this is like, again, it's like, it's something happening now that I can go and watch. Uh, like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not um, a prestige or like a kind of, he's not doing, it's not like a homage that's taken too far. He's done his own thing with it. And I don't know how he's managed to because it's hard to these days. Uh, but yeah, just brilliant. I can't talk talk him up enough. I think he's I think he's a little genius, and um, I'm I just really rate him. <laughs> well, we uh, we, we put a Spotify playlist together to accompany this podcast, so um, people will be able to go and listen to it. Uh, on, on oh, there great! As well, um, alongside all the other tracks that um, we, we spoke about on this podcast. So, as we start to sort of find ourselves easing our way out of lockdown and uh, and hopefully to a safe and brighter future, um, what's coming up? Well, we were about to release um, our record, um, uh, like our, our second record, and it's, this, the, it's the first release we've had since 2017. Um, so it's quite a while, while ago we released anything. Uh, so I'm very excited about it. I, always, I feel like this record's been cursed. I've been saying this a lot recently. Uh, there's like, you know, The Exorcist was a cursed film. Yeah. And uh, I feel like this album is <laughs> like, oh, gonna... oh my God, you, like, I'm, I'm worried about people owning it. I'm hoping the curse is lifted when we get to the... Uh, when it gets the release date, that's what I've been saying in my head. Um, like it's either that or that, like, you know, it's like a Ghostbusters scenario when it all goes wrong and, and, and it all goes everywhere, you know, we're all, we're all infected, um, you know, uh, but uh, we've, we've, been, we've been through the ringer with this one, um, you know, like we really have. We've, I like, uh, it's been so many panic attacks and late nights and um, kind of fights and, 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 and uh, my mum's partner passed away. It's been a lot of death and tragedy in this. And Ian, Ian got very, very unwell while we were making it. Um, and so he he was sectioned uh, in the in the priory down here, um, and so there's a lot been a lot of very real world trauma. But even like in a, in a more like ridiculous sense, the cello player that came into the strings broke his leg on the way into the studio one day. Uh, the Graham Humphreys, the man who um, does all the amazing poster art, if you ever seen our tour posters, that, uh, he did all the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street stuff. Um, he fell down an escalator and broke, broke his leg. The the um the pat the plant that pressed the records in California. Our record went through and there was a fire and it burnt down. Like, honestly, I know. I'm going to wrap this podcast up together. right now. Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't stress to you. Like, we, we say, we talk about the creeper curse in this one. It's, um, it's really been a journey. Uh, and since um, when we, we put our last one to this, to this place, I know we actually spoke about earlier on. Bands are throwing out material now, left, right, and center. And this is an unusually long gap um, for a, a band's follow up. In, in this climate, anyway. Um, 
but it's an unusual record. It's weird. It's, it's weird as shit. It's a weird record. Um, and I love it. I'm really, really proud of it. It's um, uh, Patricia from Sisters of Mercy. Sing, uh, the spoken word on it. We, uh, we managed to get like friends of ours involved um, to, to, do, to do things. And, wow. Um, I know, man. It's so cool. Uh, I, I met Patricia. She, she's obviously um, Dave Vanian's uh, uh, partner. And I love The Damned. One of my favorite bands of all time. Went to see The Damned so many times. I met them both at, a, um, at the Kerrang Awards again. Like a, uh, it was, it was a, a, the, the, a, the year after my, my, my ridiculous Skiba story. Um, uh, I met them both there. And turns out they've been taking their daughter, Emily, to see Creeper because she's a Creeper fan. And so I was like, oh, no way. I'm, I literally love, like, the, Fuddland is one of my favorite records, you know? Um, and like Machine Gun Etiquette, that was like the soundtrack to was when I was younger too, you know? Like, I was like, God, this is amazing. So we made, just became friends and they would, they would come to, so creeper things, um, and we, we, you know, obviously, like, we would never make them pay to see us ever. They're like royalty to me, and um, uh, goth, goth royalty. And um, so, yeah, really, really cool. They, 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 um, they invited me and my girlfriend to the um, the damn show with the Circus of Horrors, the Palladium, um, and they, like we had like. He looked so good, Davani, in there. Oh God, it was so sick. It was so cool. And then we went to the after show. Imagine this, okay, like me and my girlfriend are both really bad goths, you know, we're, we're, so, goth, we're so into that scene, so like this is like a dream come true for us. We had the Circus of Horrors, and then it was, um, it was The Damned, where he shaved his hair off in the intermission and became Nosferatu, came back out dressed up as Nosferatu midway through the performance. I was like, amazing, and my girlfriend loves him as well. And, and so it was, it, they invited us to the after show. We entered this after party down in, um, uh, in I think it was in Soho somewhere, and um, I was like, well, you have to go. You know, we have to go. And we went in. They gave us a glass of wine. And we went and found a table. While a man played Aladdin Sane on the piano. A pianist just sat there and played the entirety of Aladdin Sane. Well, and then Dave Vanian came over and we hung out with Emily. And I was like, this is the coolest thing in the world. You guys, are so, <laughs> why are you being so nice to us? We're just like this, these little weird punk kids, you know? Like, so they're yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely people. And I wanted an American voice uh, to play this, the character in my American record. So I asked Patricia if she would do it. And, um, and she was so lovely and said, oh yeah, of course, I'll come by. Came by the studio in, in London, we were doing some bits and just was amazing, just amazing. It was like a dream come true. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a spectacularly weird record we've made. It's very varied, very odd. The middle section has a country song. There's a, a do what number. There's a, um, there's, it ends with a piano ballad and uh, there's a, a song that sounds like Swade in the middle of all that nonsense. It's just, it's just going on and on and on. It, uh, and uh, it's, yeah, I'm very proud of it. It's a very odd record. And um, yeah, we really tried to go all in on it. And it's finally coming out on July 31st. Um, so Wonderful. Well, I'll the curse will be lifted. The, well, this podcast, um, when it comes out, the album will be out. So we, we'll add a, um, some tracks onto the playlist as well so people can get a real flavour that, that may not have um, heard Creeper Music before. And, uh, and yeah, and where's a good place for people to find out about what Creeper are up to? So you can find out all the, all the usual places you can find us on, um, on Twitter, Creeper Cult UK, on Instagram, it's all the same tag, on Facebook. We have a website as well, which, um, which has recently, recently been kind of redone, which is a lot better than when we made it originally. Um, it is uh, creepercult.com.com. Oh my God, not creepercult.com. <laughs> Oh, right, that's me so should have called it that. <laughs> <laughs> We're a completely different type of creeper there. Do you know how many times Brilliant. we get tagged in weird things uh, in the course of this band on the internet? Pervy, pervy dudes looking up a woman's skirt, tagging creeper cult on, 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 on Twitter, or just on Facebook, getting tagged in loads of photos where like someone's taking a family photo and someone's photobombed it at the back, and they've tagged him, that guy as a creeper, but they've tagged the band creeper as well. So we get tagged in all these really funny pictures all the time, or really horrendous, kind of like gross things. I don't Dangerous know if that's really like bad that. or incredibly brilliant marketing. I mean, uh, I wouldn't. I don't really want to be known as the band that's associated <laughs> with these things. So we have to see you. Um, but that is the risk we 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 ran when we um, named the band Creeper. You know, a word that with my lisp I constantly call Creeper. So um, you know, it's yeah, um, nothing wrong with having a lisp, mate. I've been podcasting for a few years with one. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Will, thank you so much for your time today, mate. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, no, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed chatting to you about, about all of this nonsense, you know. Um, it's been good hearing your side of, the, of the, uh, the Marilyn Manson stuff as well. What a cool story. That's mad. And best of luck with the album, buddy. 
thank you so much. Um, are, are we going for real now on, on the on the chat as well? <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to press stop on it and then I'll say thank you to you afterwards. It's always weird. No one ever knows what to do here because I've done a few where I've gone, oh, thank you very much for being on. And then I've pressed stop and then they've gone, okay, thanks. And then it just hung up the Zoom recording. I was like, oh, I was actually going to say thank you separately from that. So we'll do that. So I'm going to press stop on here. <laughs> thank you, mate. I'll press stop on there.